Hello, the internet, and welcome to Open Source Directions, hosted by Quansight, the webinar that brings you all the all of the news about the future of your favorite open source projects. My name is Anthony Skopatz, your host for Open Source Directions. Co-hosting with me today is David Charbonneau. Hi, I'm David Charbonneau, and I'm excited to be the co-host for this episode of Open Source Directions. Uh, I lead development of open teams at Quansight, and I'm based in Durham, North Carolina. And our guest today is Jim Bednar. Jim, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, even though you've been on the show once before? Hi, I'm Jim Bednar, or Jim Bednar, <laughs> if you're being formal. Um, and I lead the PyBiz development team at Anaconda Incorporated, uh, based in Austin, Excellent. Texas. So before we dive into the meat of the episode, we're going to do our, our brief personalization section. So this week, we're going to do a tweet of the week again. Um, we first up. So basically, every one every one of our panelists is going to present a tweet that they've been enjoying this past uh, past week. So Jim, you're first up as our guest. Uh, so basically, I don't know if I'm enjoying it, but I'm enjoying watching um, the uh, tweets go back between uh, Fernando Perez and Jake Vanderplas. Uh, Jake presented some uh, very nice features of Google Collaboratory, and then Fernando was taking him to task perhaps for not making sure that everything is released as open source and contributed back to Jupyter where a lot of the ideas started. Um, of course, if you go further back, the ideas went back to Mathematica before that, so you might want to contribute them back to Mathematica. <laughs> anyway, it's, uh, it's different opinions and different ideas on how one should interact with open source, how companies uh, and proprietary information and open source uh, uh, meet each other. And sometimes happily, sometimes yeah. not. It's uh, definitely a doozy of a thread. I would, I would check it out. Uh, David, what's your tweet this week? Uh, this week, uh, it was exciting to see that Virgin Galactic made it to space. Um, I think they went two or three kilometers above the threshold mm -hmm. at which you earn your astronaut designation from NASA. Uh, so that was very exciting. They've been working on that for a long time and uh, very cool to see. Yeah, that, that was really neat to, to watch as well. Uh, for my part, my friend Roman Yurchak tweeted this week, started using Black for automatic code formatting in Python. Can confirm that not having to think about formatting is refreshing. I, uh, I couldn't agree more. So we'll include the links to all those tweets and everything in the show notes. Uh, but now it's time to go dive into the actual meat of our discussion. So first, we're going to introduce Data Shader, which was what Jim is here to chat about. Um, so Data Shader is a graphics pipeline system for creating meaningful representations of large data sets quickly and flexibly. The project has about uh, 1,400 stars on GitHub and about 2,300 downloads per month uh, across both PyPI Py Py and and Conda to the best of our ability to measure measure it. So, um, David, you want to go ahead and ask uh, ask our first question of Jim here? Absolutely. Uh, so, Jim, why was this project started? Well, basically, uh, we've had the ability to plot data and visualize data for centuries now. The first um, scientific journals had some rudimentary charts, and the the, the basic technologies for it have been plotting along for, for centuries without a whole lot of change. Basically, you put a data point mm -hmm. on a chart, or you put a line on a chart, and then if you have more, you keep doing that. And the problem with that is that if you have more, eventually what you put the second time overwrites mm -hmm. what you put the first time. And so in our current modern era of big data just being awash with data everywhere, the old techniques do badly when there's more data, whereas we should be having techniques that do well when there's more data. When there's more data, you should be able to figure out more. You should be able to see more. And that hasn't been the case with traditional plotting systems. And so we wanted to um, build something from the ground up that was, well, what if you had infinite data? What would you do then? And data shader is designed for effectively infinite data. So that being said, what need does it fill exactly? So basically, just we're just assuming you have a large data set, and it doesn't matter how large. And so we work very hard to make sure that it doesn't matter how large it is. It, it doesn't matter if it fits in your memory. It doesn't matter if it fits on your computer. It just has to be something, uh, in this case, something that Dask can handle. And Dask uh, can handle out-of-core operation. It can handle anything across a cluster. And it will take that um, data 
and render it into an image, and then that image can be embedded into a plot. And so you can have something that looks like a normal plot, but is far beyond the, what the, the typical plotting mechanisms can handle, both in terms of uh, producing a plot like that, but also just in terms of being able to handle that much data without dying or without uh, crashing, without uh, okay. having some error. Yeah. And then the second thing is that it does so without having, without you having to put in any parameters necessarily. It starts out just by assuming that the data is, exists and you want to render it as faithfully as possible on the screen without knowing what it is. Because the thing with large data is that you don't know what it is until you can look at it. So there's a chicken and egg problem. With a small data set, you can look at your 20 points and decide how should I best visualize this. With big data, you have to first dump it on the screen, then figure it out, and then adjust it over time. So we want to have an initial re representation that is faithful and accurate and does, makes as few assumptions as possible about the data and gets it in front of your eyeballs in a way that your eyeballs can appreciate immediately before tweaking. And that's, again, that's not something the existing plotting programs right. are set yeah. up to handle. Are there any alternative uh, projects out there? Uh, at the same time as DataShare was, data share was being developed, um, there was a project, there's a project called VAEX, V-A-E-X. And essentially, uh, when given point data, they do essentially the same thing. Both of them do a 2D histogram accumulating each data point into each pixel, counting the number of the data points that land in that pixel, and then allowing you to visualize it in various ways after that. Um, where they differ is that Vakes offers uh, 3D aggregations, so you can uh, collect points into a volume, uh, whereas Datastator offers many different types of data, not just points, but grids, lines, meshes, and rasters. And so they're complementary, they have an intersection where they cover exactly the same ground, but then they're complementary in what they offer otherwise. And then there are a couple of uh, proprietary approaches um, from, uh, for instance, the company used to be called MapD, called Omnisci, does a lot of the same ideas of aggregating where the data is and then taking the aggregate and moving it elsewhere. In this case, where the data is, right. is on mm -hmm. GPU and they aggregate it on the right. GPU so that you don't have to pull all of your data out of the GPU to visualize it. They do the visualization on the on the GPU. A very similar idea. And then uh, nanocubes is a way of uh, slicing and dicing data in a similar way of having it um, uh, aggregated into small chunks. Gotcha. Cool. So what technology is, sorry, we're getting some really bad echo, but uh, what technology is the data shader built on? I know you mentioned Dask before, so. So it's built on, it doesn't assume Dask, but it can use Dask. So it can use Pandas uh, data frames or uh, Dask data frame. And Pandas is great if you have your thing fits in memory, but uh, it's essentially the same approach as Pandas, but for uh, out of core operation or distributed operation with Dask. Um, and it also uses Numba. A data shader is a pure Python program. Uh, VAEX, for instance, uh, has custom C code. But um, data shader is just Python code, but it's been uh, just in time compiled with the Numba system down to machine code. And that's what makes it very fast and able to handle uh, large amounts of memory. It, it doesn't have, it can use all the cores on your, on your um, laptop, all the cores available on a uh, distributed system. Uh, thanks to Numba getting you out of, being able to write Python, but then getting you out of Python for actual execution. Nice. So uh, who started Data Shader? I guess maybe five years ago now, there was a, a research project called XData from DARPA. And this is designed to kind of push the envelope on what, what can be done with understanding data. Um, uh, at that time, there were several different collaborators who all would uh, start to have meetings. Uh, Anaconda um, Analytics uh, was one of the partners, but there were a lot of other partners. Um, and uh, the ideas for data shader came out of that. What if we had infinite data? What would we do? How would we make it something displayable? Um, and, and prototypes were built during that project. But that was a prototype in Java um, and for in a different context. Mm -hmm. And then um, nowadays, uh, uh, Peter Wang was involved in that project. And uh, he, uh, when I joined Anaconda, he authorized me to be able to spend some part of my time developing um, data shaders. So it was a completely new uh, code base, 
most of the original code written by uh, Jim Chris, and then the rest from from me at the time. Nowadays, there are lots. Uh, there are about twenty different people because Data Shader. Get, every time Data Shader gets used in a new project, that person joins for a while, contributes a bunch of stuff, and then goes on. I'm the one who stays around. So <laughs> that's I'm, a, the, that, I'm the head of it and the leader of it. That, that's but a great open source story, really, right? just, where uh, folks join in and move on, and and the code continues to evolve and, and improve. That's that's very exciting. Yes and no. Uh, <laughs> it's almost all of the big. Contributors have been Anaconda employees, so it is completely open source. There's a, it's every every bit is open source, but it's all, almost all of the work is funded, rather than uh, somebody spends a um, a semester and dives into it and then contributes the result. What has happened is that people who do that don't contribute anything; they're just using it. They see it, they use it, they post some pictures on Twitter, and I see them, and that looks great. But no code comes out of that in general. Data Shader has a lot of of happy users who don't contribute code because it's a kind of a it's a brain dead simple thing what it does it just turns your data into an image and that's just inherently valuable and useful and people can use that and they write code around it primarily rather than contribute code to data shader it's when we we need to really push the limits of what data shader can do is when corporate money flows in makes this stuff happen other people just use it without Pushing it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, so they're they're not pushing the envelope, in which case then they don't they don't hit the rough edges. Then they just get annoyed by them, I'm sure. Right. So you've sort of answered this already, but it sounds like you maintain the project. Is that right? I'm uh, the, or an, Anaconda. I'm the maintain? one person who's. I, I guess I have the most commits, and I'm the one constant person. Uh, so I make sure it all adds up. Um, uh, but I this team so I'm and I, really when I see a big problem I never have time to do it myself so I hey hey you you you're right. good at this De so, delegation right <laughs> I, I delegate uh, yeah first uh, first element of stewardship I think in a lot of ways so uh, what communities and users uh, are, are users and, and contributors from it sounds like most you know, or all contributors are from anaconda but what about users? Not all contributors, I think about all the major chunks are from Anaconda. We have, I think, seven contributors from outside of Anaconda. Um, but probably, but the users are anybody who has big data. And so a lot of, some of them are going to be corporations who have their own data, and I usually don't see what happens there. Other, others are people in government who uh, I do see what happens there because they're usually using public data. And then there are other people who just download put some public data set and say, wow, look how cool this is. And they, then they post that. Um, and we tend to, the ones that get posted um, kind of center around geographic data because that's very communicable. It's like, oh, look at this. Here's, uh, here's all the shipping around the UK, for instance. Yeah. And here it is. And then, uh, or here's every light in the world currently. <laughs> and whatever. And so, and those will be laid out in a geographic context, and people immediately see that, and they know what it means, mm -hmm. and they pass it around, and these things get flow around the web. But it doesn't. Data Shader doesn't care about whether it's geographic; it just cares about there's an x-axis and a y-axis. And so, some of those uh, uses, I think, are more are less popular, and they don't spread. So, I don't see as much about the non-geographic applications. Very cool. Um, at this point, we're going to dive into one of my favorite sections, which is the project demo or walkthrough. And I think this will be particularly exciting for Data Shader. So Jim, I, I know that you have some demos you can give us a tour through. So if there's, uh, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. And again, okay. Okay. So, that, uh... if anyone has questions, again, just reminding you all to go ahead and ask them now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we'll get to them in the Q&A section. OK, we've got the infinite regress hallway. Excellent. Yeah, that's actually my favorite part. Is, uh, that. <laughs> yeah, that's <excellent. laughs> that yeah. trippy break. So is this? OK, so <laughs> hmm? all right, the uh, important takeaways, go to datashader.org. So I'll, just, uh, I'll move into the basic demo so you can see what, um, what Datashader does. This is our. Our bog standard demo of um, taxi, da uh, taxi data points. Um, in this case, they're drop-off locations for a taxi. And all that really matters is they are XY coordinates. So 
So this could have been anything, which is people easily can go from this and they use any geographic coordinates they have and they then they post a picture, which is a fun thing. Um, so in this case, uh, it's been embedded in a, in a bokeh plot. And so just to walk you through what happens and what data shader is doing, if I zoom in here, for a brief moment, you see a pixelated version, and then you'll see it redraw the image. Um, this particular one, um, if you zoom in enough, it'll it'll stop. Um, at each moment, what it's doing is finding out the range of geographic coordinates that I happen to be looking at. Um, and it, it's, if you watch it, it's been queuing up, so redrawing all 10 million points each time. Um, and it's it knows the resolution of my screen, and it's it knows the the latitude and longitude range that I've zoomed into, and so it tells data. Um, Bokeh computes all that in my browser, and then uh, works out um, what what range of uh, data there is, passes that on to Data Shader along with the resolution, and Data Shader iterates through the 10 million points, uh, figures out if uh, which ones are inside this viewable port that we're looking at. Uh, increments that pixel and then uh, moves on to the next data point. So if I uh, zoom out, it does the same thing again. You can count them one, two, five, four, three, five, five uh, something like 10 times it's iterating through those 10 million points uh, just because I queued up 10 events and it redraws and eventually it settles down and it shows you the current rendering or aggregation of this data for the viewport that we're looking at. And so you can see that uh, people tend to be picked up on roads. Um, if you look very closely, you can see sometimes they're picked up in the middle of the water, which is obviously a bad GPS error or something. Um, and you can do, do various um, uh, queries and manipulations of the data. But this fundamentally is what it's doing. It's taking your data, turning it into an image, embedding it in a browser, um, and letting you explore it. Wow, that, that's pretty incredible. So is there... How responsive, I guess, is it? We're seeing its responsiveness live here, but you know, like it, each time we you zoom into a different level, but you said it's going through all 10 million points. Is it doing anything where it's like rendering part of that data and, and shipping that back to you sooner just so you have something no, to look at? That is a roadmap okay. item. Ah. Um, to be a little bit smarter okay. about that. Um, but it, uh, maybe I should switch to the, this, this is taxi data. There's, there's another example here that is um, data for, um, these are GPS coordinates from OpenStreetMap. This is 1 billion points, that was 10 million. And this is for the entire world and it helps illustrate that, that issue, which is um, uh, for one thing, the 1 billion case has swapped out while I was doing anything else. Uh, 1 billion points is what fits in my I browser. And so uh, it has to reload that back into memory. Sorry, not into my browser, onto my laptop's machine. So this is running here locally on my laptop. And, um, and when I work on anything else, those 1 billion points get uh, swapped out. Mm -hmm. So if I switch to this one, uh, it has to swap them back in. But uh, now it's finally done so. Uh, so now if I zoom in, um, uh, it will be able to update the screen. Um, but when I do that, it's going to go through all 10, uh, all 1 billion points every time I zoom, even if I'm just zooming in from, say, Europe to Germany, right. um, it goes through everything again. So there, just you just watched it render a billion points. Um, and now if I zoom into the UK, um, it'll, it's processing a billion points again. Uh, it just did that once and updated the screen, um, and now did it the second time. Right. And so uh, now I'll do one more zoom to somewhere in England. Um, and uh, it's going to sit there. It starts at the top of the uh, list of a billion points and iterates through all billion points again. Right. Even though we could have saved the result from the previous one, we didn't. So hopefully that makes sense. It's, uh, there is a lot that we could gain by having a a data structure that is geographically aware or aware of our axes in this case and knows not to revisit all the data points, but this is what we currently have. Right, that, that's really interesting. So if I were to do a pan, it's going to have to iterate through all billion points to be able to fill in these missing areas again. So as the name implies and as some of the colors we've seen, so what is what is the shader part of data shader doing? How does that come into play there? 
So data shader has basically got two steps. It does aggregation, which is to take all your data points and then put them onto this 2D grid. Right. And that'll give you an, an array of numbers. They aren't pixels yet, they're numbers, they're counts in this case, but they could be anything. They could be the mean of the data points, they could be a uh, standard deviation or some min, max, whatever statistic you might wanna run per pixel is, is a number in this array. And then the shading part is to turn that number into, um, into a color. And so in this case, the second, the shading part is done by histogram equalization so that uh, you notice I don't have to tweak anything when I zoom in and zoom out, even though the number of data points has changed by a factor of, I don't know, uh, millions, hundreds right. of millions. Uh, <laughs> it's all automatically uh, calculating what to show at whatever my new um, uh, viewport is. And so that part is, um, call, is uh, using technique from image processing called e histogram equalization to make uh, detail visible pretty much everywhere, wherever you are, uh, automatically. Very interesting. Other, you need to tweak a whole bunch of knobs. Uh, oh, I want to see my data again. Uh, it'd be a very painful process. Right. So basically, this is how, in this case, I'm using Data Shader together with Bokeh to provide the interactivity and Holoviews to uh, provide the link between data shader and um, and Holoview and uh, Bokeh. But in general, uh, you can use data shader on its own. It's also it can also be embedded in uh, Plotly. There's a new um, interface in Plotly That's for exciting. embedding data shader. In principle, uh, we it, it can be done in Matplotlib, um, and we have a partial PR that does that, but it was never merged into either data shader or Matplotlib. Uh, so uh, that that's something. If, it, if there are any interested Matplotlib users, that's something to uh, to volunteer for. It's not a big job, but it'd be fun for them. Uh, I don't use it, right. so I haven't done that. Um, right. At this point, I'd I'd like to just show um, what it is people have been using it for. Yeah, that'd that's, be really interesting. I did that bit. Um, if you just look on the web for data shader, I enjoy doing this. Just every once a month, I go see. Um, what have people been doing with data shader? And I saw the first two are mine here. I did those two <laughs> things. Those are great. But then number three, I didn't do that. Number four, I didn't do that. Number five, I don't even know what that is, but they did that. Number six, I didn't do. And I just click around and see. Like uh, So in this case, uh, this is the US census. Um, this is where people live in America with no tweaking. There is no... Um, there's no parameter involved in generating this image. You just take the U.S. Census, which is a bunch of G uh, GPS coordinates, essentially, latitude and longitude for every 300 million people in America, and you turn it into an image with a what we call a data shader. There's no, this is, so a lot of times you'll see images like this, and usually they're carefully sculpted and crafted. It's just literally mapping it onto That's the That's pretty impressive. Fantastic. Um, That's pretty impressive. Actually, I can uh, even, it uh, looks like Google sees the related ones. Here's somebody who's done uh, a one billion data uh, points from uh, taxis. I don't know what this one is. Oh, bicycle trips. Okay, somebody used this to do bicycle trips in Austin uh, using data shader and also using my <laughs> color map. I, I like that. And, Let's see, uh, this one, I, I love this example here, which is um, from Instacart. This is, um, if I'm remembering correctly, this is San Francisco, and the colors are which grocery store an Instacart shopper ended up at. So this is tracking the, the routes of a bunch of Instacart shoppers. So these are people who are buying groceries for other people. And it's uh, keeping track of how they move across um, the city to get to the grocery store. And then Instacart published an analysis of the way they moved inside the store. So it has it down to the uh, each of the aisles inside the store. And they're studying how, uh, whether they can opt. Uh, I assume they're looking at whether they can optimize the paths of their shoppers through that's, the store. Uh, that's impressive. Yeah. That's really, that's really. Um, this means something. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. One last thing. Uh, I just I had no idea what this means. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty big thing, though. Uh, I think it's something to do with how numbers behave on floating point, but I'm not certain. 
and so on. It's just uh, you can click on uh, lots of stuff and figure out what people are using things for. It's uh, yeah, it's that's neat. great. That's all. Yeah, very cool. I'll look forward to clicking around myself trying to find some things. Yeah. Um, David, did you have anything you wanted to ask on the uh, demo section before we move on? Uh, no, I, that was really, really wonderful. Thank you. All right. So now we are going to move on to our roadmap discussion, uh, which is the meat of our episode. So broadly speaking, we're going to be discussing kind of where the project is going, how you can contribute either uh, as a corporate entity uh, or someone with funding uh, or as uh, an individual, how you can contribute code and and uh, support the project in those ways. So the roadmap is, uh, which you can find either on the data shader website or at quantsite.com slash projects, uh, describes a bunch of elements of these sorts of things where, you know, it's where, what data shader believes is in scope, where the project is going and how you could help and sort of places where um, contributions would be particularly welcome. So uh, we're just going to go through the top few roadmap items right here to, to start, and you can go read more. So, and uh, we'll discuss with Jim here what they are. So uh, first up is adding more data types that can be data shaded. So do you want to describe that for our viewers and listeners here, Jim? Sure. Um, I think most of the examples I've shown so far are aggregating point data. And because of GPS, the ready availability of GPS, tons of people have tons of point data. So that's always fun. Um, but uh, there are other uh, data that you can visualize, such as um, extremely large numbers of lines. Uh, let me see. There was an example. OK, here's an example. So what if you have an experiment where you're measuring a ton of things at once, such as an imaging experiment, or um, or if you're laboriously collecting um, data from, say, uh, 100,000 neurons, uh, often what you'll do is, um, with traditional techniques, you might uh, characterize that as uh, just run statistics on it. With data shader, you can actually plot all of those overlapping. Uh, I don't know what this particular plot is um, that's come up on my screen, but. Um, oh. It looks like a repeatable event, and you can see the full range of, um, of types of responses or t um, types of lines that you see, and you can see both the dense bits and the outliers and so on. And so if you use a data shader with extremely large numbers of curves, you can understand entire populations of hundreds of thousands or millions of curves uh, in ways that just aren't really possible otherwise. You could take a representative one, or you could find the max and the min. But how do you understand every point in between? Well, data shader will help you do that for lines uh, and curve data. And then there are other things. Uh, we can use uh, uh, very large meshes, very large rasters. But there, there are things that data shader can't do right now, which is very large collections of polygons, um, arbitrary polygons. These are very common in geo applications, which you have um, state boundaries and district boundaries and things like that. Eventually, if you have fine enough level of detail, you need data shader to make those practical. So we don't have support for that. And there are other different types of data. Anything that, that eventually is visualizable is potentially data shadable. But right now, we just have points, lines, rasters, and uh, meshes. So anything else gotcha. is fair game. So there, there's room to expand in the in sort of what what types of in those kinds of types and sort of the fundamental plotting artifacts or, or objects, maybe. Yeah. The end, basically, it's anything you should be able to come in. The result is going right. to be a raster, so a set of pixels on your screen. But that's true sure. for any plotting ever, right? So right. It, it's, it's <laughs> um, sounds like a great place for folks to jump in and, and help. So another uh, item you have on the roadmap is better integration with plotting libraries like Bokeh, Hollow Views, Plotly, and Matplotlib. Um, did you want to go into a little more uh, detail on that? Integration with Bokeh, where Bokeh is controlling the interactive user experience and Data Shader was doing the rendering. There are a lot of holes in that interface where, oh, I wish I could do that. And no, uh, it doesn't quite support it. So in certain cases, so in some cases, for instance, you can easily get a color bar and see exactly what goes on. You can hover and see the underlying data, but not if you choose histogram equalization. Uh, no, the the answer is no in that case. And so, 
cases that you'd want to work well, but it hasn't been fully integrated because each little step, data shader is just rendering in a completely different way. You know, a data shader plot with, of a small amount of data can look just like a one, uh, native one in Bokeh or in uh, plot layer map plot lib, but it's rendered in an entirely different way. And so we have to kind of build some other things you might take for granted, build them up from the ground up. And so we've done that a bit, but there's a good bit more to do for the Bokeh and Holobies interfaces. And then the Plotly interface is brand new, so um, there, there still will be work to do. And botplotlib just isn't, it's only barely there. So that needs lots of work. Yeah, that, uh, that matplotlib one in particular sounds like something that people um, from the various communities would be able to jump in and, and see a big benefit from um, because matplotlib is such a huge project and has so many users and everything. So, um, but it, please. it's, what? Please. Yeah, please, <laughs> please help. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. You've heard the call internet. Yeah, you've heard, yeah. We, we summon you as our personal army of software developers. Uh, mm. Yeah, so the next roadmap item is sort of a generic improved speed and memory performance. So this is, I imagine there's, are there particular bottlenecks that you're seeing that you would like to address? Well, or? Um, well, basically, it's, uh, the way data shader development has gone is that initially we paid a lot of attention to the speed and how it used memory, uh -huh. because that that's what made anything possible. And then gradually other things get added over time, and we've never set up a monitoring system to, to see when some new thing we added suddenly makes things not use memory very efficiently or suddenly added a bottleneck and we didn't know it. And then every once in a while we find those, and we go, oh, no, we better fix those and then it uh, decays again. So basically, if we never touch the code base, it would stay very fast and good use of memory, but every time we're changing anything, it's in danger of messing those up. And the current state is that I don't know if we're at anywhere near the, the maximum speed, uh, that we not only that it's ever been, but that it could be. Um, and I know that there are certain cases where Shoot, that seems to be using all my memory, and that data set is not big enough to need that. I don't understand why, but we it hasn't ever been something we were working on. So basically, I am quite confident that there are quick gains to be had, but no current funding to make those happen. Yeah. So and that can be the difference between it works on my laptop or completely huge cluster. So it is important. Right, it's sort of, and it's kind of at the core of the technology. It, it seems like today. That's right. yeah. Those, um, yeah, it's not I, I, I hesitate to call them a test suite, but sometimes I guess they, they sort of are test suites. They're kind of regression-oriented test suites to find whether your performance has gone down. Those are very tricky in my experience to develop. So I understand why you haven't done that. <laughs> uh, what did we have, and then they go away. It was, we've done them on many projects. The problem is hardware moves on, and you can never rerun the same thing again. Right. Uh, never same river twice. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's tricky. <laughs> David, I'm, I'm looking at I'm looking at the roadmap document, and uh, one of the things it mentions here is um, hollow views should be able to allow users to set criteria for when data shader will be substituted for points or path plot based on size. Yeah. Um, did you want to? Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Or so uh, right now in Holoviews, uh, if you're a Holoviews user and you have some plot and you are about to load 50 times more data in in the plot, you can first write data shade and then whatever you were previously going to do, and it will henceforth data shade that. So be, so it'll work with your data, but before it ever shows it to you, it will make sure that it calls data shader on it. Large data sets. But what if you need to go back and forth between data sets that are sometimes small and sometimes big? Right now, what happens is either it's always data shaded, and as we mentioned, sometimes data shaded has uh, doesn't support everything you might want to do, um, or uh, either you always data shade and it's always safe, but it doesn't always have full functionality. Or for the small data set, you can use the full functionality, but if you ever happen to use a large data set, it'll crash your browser because without hollow, without data shader, um, what Bokeh will do is diligently try to do exactly what you told it to do. And if you told it to display 500 million points, 
It's going to take all those 500 million points, feed them into your browser, and your browser is going to bulk somewhere around 200,000 points. Um, and so what we don't have is a way that can be reactive to the data set size. So they can just set a, a, a threshold. Okay, above 100,000 points, don't you ever try to feed it to the browser. Always call data yeah. shader on that. Even if it is losing some plot elements, at least it won't crash, at least it won't ruin my browser, and at least it won't take a week. Right. That would be but really, really helpful. Done. Yeah. Well, are there, um, are there any other points on the roadmap that you'd like to bring up? I know there's a, there's a lot of them. <laughs> and so if there's something specific uh, you wanted to highlight that we haven't gone over. So yeah, I'll bring up one, which is that the um, uh, data shader works on, uh, like I said at the beginning, it works on the assumption you have infinite data available. So if you have some distribution like this, uh, if you're still looking at my screen, the- oh, Your um, screen went away. Or, or not, can you uh, share it? Okay, so basically, if you look at the US census data that's showing the uh, distribution, if there were infinite numbers of people, it would do a, a perfectly accurate rendering. Well, what happens when you've zoomed into some sparse area and you only have a few points now or a, a small number of lines? Right now, each one of those only occupies at most one pixel because if it's one, one data point, it lands in one pixel and in no other pixel. And if it's one line, it crosses each pixel or doesn't cross it, either one. And that's what data shader works, uh, how data shader works. So you can see a clump of 50, no problem. But if you're zoomed in and now only now seven on your screen, we don't have very good ways of dealing with that. And we have we have ways, but they are not very good ways. Right. And so one thing you could do is to make a point have an extent in space. Right now, a point is effectively infinitely tiny and a line is infinitely thin which works great when you want to collect a lot of them, not great if you want to see one and you're getting older like me and can't see things on the screen as well. So we, we want to work on way, we have no funding for this, but we would like to work on ways to um, deal with the low data case or the isolated point case uh, better where that was where traditional plotting worked fine. But if you're zooming in and out, you can't just switch to another plotting program or traditional method. You want it to have something that it really is reactive and responsive, and it, it works well in low data case and in high data case, and that's what we're missing. Right. That, that's, right. that's yeah. That point about being yeah, the traditional the, plotting case is kind of is very interesting. It's, it seems like because you're dealing with so much data that you you then are missing the sort of more normal use case for a lot of other plotting. Um, that sounds like a perfectly reasonable and very. Uh, a great place for folks to jump in either with funding or in terms of code contributions, um, you know, from like, the outside what, world. Even if you just had a great idea, what if it behaved like this and you could sketch that out and really just say, uh, say it in a concrete way that, oh yeah, you know, if it did behave like that, I bet it would work. That would be enough mm -hmm. to get us started. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, well, at this point, uh, David, do you have any other questions on the roadmap, or should... uh, I do not. Um, but there is something interesting I just thought of in relation to what you just said. There, there was a paper I saw today on Darwinian selection of. Uh, it, it had to do with list data types like trees and lists and arrays, and, and choosing the storage mechanism appropriate to your uh, available memory and, and the amount of data that you had. And it, this sounds similar-ish, right? Where you might have a, a variety of, of rendering approaches that you might want to choose from and um, you know, have some sort of selection approach to, to choose the most appropriate one to the available you know, situation, the present parameters. Yep. Yeah, sounds interesting. Yeah, if there's anybody in an academic uh, environment who wants that as a research <laughs> topic and wants to use yeah. data as a tool to do that, yeah. go for it. I would love to be an advisor. Uh, yeah, trying to get students now too. <laughs> yeah, sure thing. Yeah, sure. Well, at this point, I think we're going to go ahead and move on to our Q and A section. So these are all questions that have previously been sent in by the users. I believe all our viewers here during this particular webinar. So, um, David, do you want to go ahead and and take the first question? Absolutely. Uh, Piaru asks. How uh, does data shader technology compare to technology used in uh, Google Maps visualization? 
Uh, that's a good question. So uh, Google Maps in lowercase, Google has a lot of technology. So I'll specifically talk about uh, one concrete one, which is tile-based map servers. And this is interesting because you can use data shader to create such things. So the way a, a tile, so I don't know if most people know what happens when you go to Google Maps and you try to zoom from all of America down onto a particular local uh, region of a block. What happens as you do that is that um, there are little map tiles. There might be, um, say, 16 by 16 tiles, little chunks of images that you're viewing when you see America. And you zoom in a bit, you get another, another set of 16 by 16 tiles, some of which you might have previously loaded so that it's uh, smooth and interactive. But these have all been pre-rendered, and all you're doing is pulling them down from a remote web server. So you're having the experience of zooming the way I showed you. There's no live processing of data involved there. It's pulling in pre-rendered things at different resolutions. And at the deepest, lowest level, the number of tiles involved is insanely <laughs> large. So there is a very large system somewhere in Google that is holding all of this information at the very detailed level. For Data Shader, this was just my laptop at every moment because only the thing I'm looking at at that one moment exists. That one tile was rendered just for me to look at, just, just for me, very custom and nothing else has ever been rendered until I go visit that spot on the earth, and then it's re-rendered. But you can use Data Shader to create the tiles that can then be served to people. If you have a large enough server you can, where disk space is, the, uh, is free and what you want to optimize is reduce computing power, then you pre-render all this stuff, serve it to the world, and you can show the data sets that I've been showing you here, you basically show them as PNGs with no Python running. Here it's running Python, so it takes time to compute, but it takes no storage to because that thing is only computed and then handed over to you. So they're complementary technologies. Which one do you want to optimize for? Immediate reactivity without any pre-rendering of anything? That's data shader. Tile servers have the opposite approach. Pre-render everything. And you can do things in the middle, which is render, cache, and so on. Yeah, very cool. So for our next question, Hamir Abbasi asks, have you tried airspeed velocity for performance? Uh, can it run all commits on, on your hardware? It may take time. Uh, and can you have multiple benchmarks? Maybe, um, yeah. The answer is yes. Okay. I, love, I love ASV. It's a, it's a great tool. Um, we actually can't run our, we can't have run all, all our commits. We don't have enough power. Uh, just running one our test suite once is very expensive. We're running it for every um, uh, because we're dealing with big data performance, not just performance, but performance on very large data sets. It's very hard to rerun all of our things for all commits. So we have to take a much more nuanced approach of of subdividing the commits when we want to see a problem. We have to run it uh, in big chunks and then go back to find it uh, and, and the problem. But yes, ASV, yeah, and just for a little bit of context, can you describe airspeed velocity in one or two sentences? Just so it's it's a it's a pun on Python, of course. Um, so it's a reference to uh, the Holy Grail. But uh, anyway, it's it's a tool for uh, taking a GitHub repo and looking at the range, uh, running a test suite against a range of commits. So if you can run, if you want to see how performance has changed over time you use ASV to run the same test against every different version. Where that becomes tricky is when your code has changed in ways that are not just about performance, but are about your API. And then you have to have the same code swapped out and able to handle every version of your, of your code, the same um, right. benchmark code. Very cool. Thanks. Uh, Jared Thompson asks, uh, can a legend be added to show the color with the trip density? Yes, um, under certain circumstances. <laughs> Basically, if you're in Bokeh and you choose linear or logarithmic mapping from your value to a color, then you can easily have a legend. There's nothing unusual going on there. It's just a standard case of a color map. If you're using histogram equalization, which is this parameter-free, non-parametric way to map color, then currently no, but we are working on it. All right. Uh, Hamir asks again, have you thought of using KD trees? I believe this is in reference to some of the performance issues and being able to 
not retile everything? The answer, of course, is the answer, of course, is yes. KD trees and quad trees for geographically or um, data space subdividing the uh, data set. And that is our planned approach. We have some funding for trying it. I don't know if it'll be enough to act. Depends how hard it is and how well it works. But we are we have funding to get started on that. I don't know if we have funding to take us all the way to ship gotcha. that. Gotcha. Very cool. That's exciting. Sounds like another thing on the roadmap or place a place where people can contribute more funding or, or code too. So uh, that's great to hear. I yep. think we're out of questions, but if anyone has any last second ones, um, and if not, without further ado, we'll go ahead and enter into our world famous rant section where each person, each panelist gets 15 seconds to rant about whatever topic that they want. Jim, it is your soapbox. Uh, data shader has ruined me, and now if I ever see a bad plot when somebody's got overplotting or undersampling or a horribly non-uniform color map, I get very angry and I feel very sad about the state of the world. <laughs> so if you have enough data that, that one of your points is in front of another point, please use data shader. And if you're using a color map, use a perceptually uniform uh, map like those from color set. And then you won't have that problem, and you won't make yeah. the angry. uniform color map thing that get that gets me every time. David, uh, what is your rant for this week? Well, I, I'm a recent convert to iOS, and one of the things that I really, really miss and has made me very frustrated about Apple uh, iOS is when you install an application uh, in Android, it it goes into like this apps folder, and you can choose how it's sorted, and you have your home screen, which is a totally different thing. And if you want to put things on your home screen, you can iOS just dumps stuff on your home screen in the order that you downloaded them. So if you're going to have a clean home screen, you have curation forced upon you. Uh, whereas in Android, you can choose to curate your stuff if you want to. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm really frustrated about the mess that results from installing apps and, and having to curate my home screen. The, uh, the iPhone travails strike again, it seems like. so. Uh, this week, I'm particularly bothered by make check, specifically with the new TLS package. I just have to wonder why it is so slow and painful, and why does it have so many seg faults? It feels as though the world, or at least Condaforge, may never know. Uh, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. You can find us on Twitter at Quantsite AI. If you're interested in funding open source projects, including Data Shader, you can find all of the project roadmaps at Quantsite.com slash projects. Uh, Jim, where can people find you and Data Shader? Uh, so the developers hang out at gitter.im slash pyviz, P-Y-V-I-Z. And we like to see issues at the uh, Data Shader GitHub site. And if you find make pretty pictures, tweet them and tag at Data Shader. And I, I always enjoy seeing them, and they're inspirational to us. Excellent. Well, everybody, thanks again. Thanks for joining us. And join us again next episode for an otherwise hard to find discussion on PyData Sparse. Bye bye. <laughs>